Hello and welcome to Dear Hank and John. Or as I prefer to think of it, Dear John and Hank. It's a podcast where me and my brother John answer your questions, give you dubious advice, and bring you all the week's news from both Mars and AFC Wimbledon. Hank, it's been a big week for AFC Wimbledon. Actually, it hasn't. It ha- there, there's not that much news from AFC Wimbledon. Is there? Is there a lot of news from Mars, or should people just stop listening to the podcast? There's always news from Mars, John! Well, there's always news from AFC Wimbledon, too. It's just... It, uh, I don't know. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? Uh, I don't know. I don't even know anymore. I'm writing a lot and I'm inside of the story. And so when I get uh, when I get frustrated uh, with the story, I feel frustrated with every other facet of my life. But I will say um, in uh, in weather news uh, here in Indianapolis, the post Taylor Swift uh, beauty that we have been experiencing, we're just clinging to it. We're just barely holding on. Um <laughs> The sky is still blue, but the temperature is, is dropping. It's a little worrisome. I'm, I'm beginning to think that fall might be in the air. Uh, how are things in Montana? Uh, it's actually very beautiful here. It's definitely fall. Lots of color on the trees. Uh, and I am doing good. I just, we, we did NerdCon stories. It turned out to go really well. It was a treat for me because I got to hang out with a bunch of great people and uh, and and watch lots of cool things happen on a stage that I was like, I would think it'd be funny if we did this. And it turned out I was right. Well, and occasionally wrong. Sometimes, but mostly right. Yeah, I just, I don't want you to be praising yourself too thoroughly. <laughs> it's, uh, it's unbecoming. Uh, well, it uh, it had very little to do with me. I just put people on a stage and crossed my fingers. Uh, and, and, it, and, uh, and I was very pleased to have all of our all of our guests and all of our attendees totally come on their A game and make a, a good thing happen. And everybody was just down to clown. It was fun. I really liked uh, the attendees of NerdCon Stories, I have to say. Um, I felt like it was a, a good and gracious bunch of people um, who uh, were positive and enthusiastic. And it was really, that, that's what made it special for me it was just, um, you know, being around people who care about. Uh, stories in the same way that I do. Uh, I felt like I felt like I was kind of with uh, with my tribe. It was uh, it was a wonderful it was a wonderful weekend. And thank you for it, Hank. The only uh, downside for me was that I was in a car race against Maggie Steve Otter, a great young adult novelist. Um, and I um, well, I crashed my car and and, and it erupted into uh, a fiery uh, tomb of death. But fortunately, I was pulled from it before um, I was injured. So other than that, I would qualify the weekend as an as an entire success. Well, I have to say, uh, in in fairness to you, you didn't crash the car. I didn't. You spun out. I spun out. It didn't hit anything. I never hit anything. You, you managed to control the yep. car that, and you didn't you didn't slam into anybody or yep. anything. Uh, but apparently, the stress of of uh, of of whatever of of losing control of the yep. car caused, I think, the brake line to break. Yep. Which uh, then sprayed b- brake fluid all over the the hot underside of the car, and apparently brake fluid is flammable. Yeah. So that happened. Yep. It was. Uh, you're right. I didn't crash. I came within about six inches of crashing into the wall, um, but didn't. And I was I was very pleased with myself for about ten seconds. I was like, look at that. I managed not to crash. I even put the car into reverse, yeah, and yeah, I was going to yeah, keep going. Yeah. And then I realized that I was on fire. Um, well, I I call that the car's fault, not yours. Do you have a short poem for us? I do. It's uh, Philip Larkin. is requested is a request actually today. Uh, oh William requested the poem "Home Is So Sad" by Philip Larkin. It's a bit of a depressing poem. I apologize for that, Hank. I know that you prefer the uh, the funny stuff. Um, but this is "Home Is So Sad" by Philip Larkin. Home is so sad. It stays as it was left, shaped to the comfort of the last to go, as if to win them back. Instead, bereft of anyone to please, it withers so having no heart to put aside the theft and turn again to what it started as, a joyous shot at how things ought to be, long fallen wide. You can see how it was. Look at the pictures and the cutlery, the music and the piano stool, that vase. Home is So Sad by Philip Larkin. Oh, home. Oh. It is so sad. Well, I guess what when you take out all of the people because everything is impermanent. Yeah. I guess that's the sadness, Hank. The underlying sadness of most stories is that everything is impermanent. I was thinking today as I was writing that um, that in a way, like all stories 
are about a uh, not just all stories, but also all of life. Um, uh, but but every story in one way or another is about a plucky young uh, hero desperately trying to escape her fate. Yep. Um, and each of us is a plucky is is a plucky young person desperately trying to escape our fate until we become middle aged. <laughs> That's not true. There are lots of plucky middle aged people trying to escape their fate. Right, I know. But the uh, the only choice is between being a plucky middle aged person trying to escape your fate and just accepting it. Um, not that not that I'm <laughs> not that I'm frustrated by how the writing's going at the moment or anything. Maybe we should answer some viewer questions in this incredibly depressing <laughs> right. humor podcast. We have a question from Renee who asks, "Dear Hank and John, my partner and I will be getting married in a couple of months. Originally, we no, planted- why bother, Renee? What's the point of being alive?" <laughs> Originally, we planned for it to be just the two of us, our officiant and our photographer, to keep things very casual, stress-free, and meaningful to us. To celebrate, and as a concession to our family and friends who wanted to be there, we decided to throw a big party later the same day. As time has gone on, we felt pressured to allow our families to attend the actual ceremony. Do you think we should stick to our guns and do what we want, or will we regret it later? Uh, it's a big question, Hank, um, and I suspect that you and I might actually disagree, so I'm interested to hear your thoughts uh, on this one. I think that I don't know Renee, and I don't know Renee's partner, but I do know that uh, marriages are about more than just the two people inside of them. I, I think that no marriage is an island, and I think that it is important. It was important to me that I had important people in my life there to witness me making that super important, most important promise I've ever made, um, and that I've needed support from outside of my marriage to make my marriage work. And I think that's that's I think that's true for everyone. Uh, and so it's good to recognize that marriage is about more than just the people getting married. Uh, and and a good way to do that, not the only way to do that, is by having those people there at the ceremony. Uh, and, and then in addition to in addition to that, in addition to the, the 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 practical needs of the people getting married, there are there are also like you know it's it is about more than just the two of you in a way. And I think that like if I was a parent and my chi- and my child was like having the most important day of their lives. Uh, I would want to be there for that. And I, I feel I would feel bad about not being so able to be there. My counter argument is that it's not one of the most important days of your life. That in fact, like the day of your wedding is is not one of the most interesting or important days of your marriage. Right. It's the day that you make a commitment uh, to a marriage. But all the interesting, cool stuff that happens uh, in a marriage, and I completely agree with you that no marriage is an island, and that marriage is every marriage, every successful marriage requires more than than the, the support of more than two people. But like, I don't think that that the wedding is that important. Um, like looking back on my wedding day, I just don't. I, I think I just that, don't think it was I that think, important. But how would you think that our mom would answer that question? How do you think she would react to not being at your wedding? Poorly, because it's really like, like, yeah. The question there, there's the question of like, what is it for Renee and Renee's partner? There's also the question of what is it for their parents, right? And and like, how how devastated are they? And I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, but I think that that my parents would uh, be crying. Yeah, uh, in silence. Yeah, I guess my advice would be to uh, sort of follow the path of least resistance, because I don't actually think yes. that, I mean, unless it's going to be super stressful and mi- miserable to have uh, family there because it's, you know, uh, broken or unapproving uh, relationships or, or unhealthy relationships or whatever, um, I really, um, you know... I. Obviously, you need the day, you need that day to be about you and your partner and the commitment that you're making. Um, and and you want that day to be special and fun and as unstressful as possible. Um, but uh, if the family relationships are healthy and functional and positive, uh, you know, I, I would I would just be like, you can come, but can you make it as unstressful for us as possible? That's what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and in a lot of ways, it may be, it may end up being more stressful to not have them there, just because you, you're creating, you're creating, right. tr- in in striving for a stress free uh, 
a stress-free marriage, you, you may end up uh, creating drama. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very. It's, sometimes it's very difficult to know what is the path of least drama. It's always the path I try to follow, but you just you, sometimes you don't know which path it is. Um, <laughs> but I, I guess, like, m- my advice to people who are getting married is always to think, uh, to try to focus more on the marriage than on the wedding, because uh, weddings pass and marriages, if you're lucky, don't pass until you do. Oh. It's all about death here on Dear Hank and John. Sorry, I just, I noticed that we'd almost answered an entire question without talking about the universality of death. (laughs) All right, John, give us another question. All right, this question comes from Matt, who writes, Dear John and Hank, I've been thinking a lot about the intelligence of animals compared to that of humans. I realize that every day my cat knows where to get its food and knows to eat it, but there's so much it could never know. No matter how hard it tried, its brain could never possibly comprehend the company that manufactures the food or the nutritional value of the food or the fact that I buy the cheaper kind because student loans are a thing. Anyway, I'm rambling. My point is, are we just cats? Are humans staring out into the universe looking right out at something that we will never actually be able to comprehend no matter how hard we try? That's my kind of question, Matt. (laughs) It's like, I was looking at my cat today and I realized that maybe we know nothing. Well, I do think that we know more than your cat, Matt. No, no disrespect to your cat, but, um, you know, this is a matter of degrees of gray, I think. Um, <laughs> the great thing about humans is that we can uh, collaborate and not just, um, you know, not, not just uh, in, in simple, straightforward ways like me saying to Matt, Matt, if we work together to pick up this log, we can pick it up, but we, neither of us can pick it up alone, but also collaborating across space and time, uh, being able to, you know, collaborate, for instance, with Socrates. Um, that's a huge, or like being able to know the laws of Hammurabi. It's a huge advantage that no other species enjoys. Um, and that does make us special. And I don't think that we are just cats. Um, but I do think that uh, we are looking out at, at the universe and uh, seeing it through very limited uh, eyes, of course, and, and also seeing it in a kind of human-centric way. Um, and that seems to me inevitable and not like not particularly tragic or horrifying or anything it's just part of part of being a person is that you you're sort of stuck inside of personness yeah it's it's often very jarring to me when i realize that the way that i've been understanding myself and my place in the universe and my relationships with people is 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 much more uh influenced by my culture and by just sort of the you know the 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 lizard brain ways that we operate and and see the world than it is on like my you know my constructed and beautiful psyche and and like whatever my ego is like whatever the thing that i i think i am turns out to be a lot simpler than the thing that i actually am sometimes uh but we're also pretty cool i mean we have been like i don't i don't know what we're missing but we figured out a lot and we continue to figure out stuff and i i feel like that that's that path is going to continue getting developed for a long, long time. And we will, we will not stop learning things. Um, and in a, in a way, uh, you know, our sort of like looking at it, the universe is, is, you know, maybe a little bit like, uh, like cats looking at food and not thinking about where the food came from. But, uh, but really the, the complicated things, the really difficult problems aren't, aren't the universe. They're all going on in our own brains and, and in the interactions between brains. And that's where all the cool stuff is and also where all of the mystery is in a lot of ways. Hank, do you ever think about the fact that your brain is made of meat? Like your brain is edible. Everything, every, all of your hopes and dreams, I could eat them. <laughs> you, well, you could eat the thing in which the hopes and dreams... Uh, the, the platform in which they exist, but you couldn't eat them themselves. They would cease existing before they got into your mouth. I think our culture around zombies and stuff really boils down uh, to that. Like our contemporary obsession with zombies is about two things. First, the feeling that, uh, you know, we may in fact not be running the show in quite the way that we think we are, that like we may not be in control of our own thoughts and desires in quite the same way that we think we are. And then second, that like, our like ourselves or or what we think of as the self which is located in the brain is edible (laughs) (laughs) yeah i mean that is each each your brains the eating of brains is definitely a uh definitely comes from there in a lot of ways comes from the place of of realizing 
that that our the 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 meat that contains ourselves is just meat. God, this is a funny podcast. Let's have another question. It's a, it's a really funny podcast. I know. Uh, I'll give you another question, John. I, I really uh, liked liked this one, and I want to talk about it. You won't maybe have much to say, but I'll, I'm interested to see what you do say. Owen asks, Dear Hank and John, this might be a mostly Hank question. If my body temperature is about 96 degrees, then why does 96 degree weather feel so hot? Why doesn't it feel neutral? I hope that makes sense. Well, first off, Owen, I am concerned because your body temperature is unusually <laughs> low. It should be at least 97.5 degrees, and the fact that it is 96 degrees has me worried. All right, now that we've gotten through the insufferable, pe- insufferable pedantry, what's your actual answer? No, I'm not being pedantic. I am, as a hypochondriac, genuinely concerned. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times I have taken my own temperature and found it to be between 96 and 97 degrees and called my physician. <laughs> I am hypothermic. Don't laugh at me. That is not a joke. Oh, okay. Anything else for, for Owen? Um, again, I really think that that's worth checking out. Okay, but anything else? Any, any actual answer to the question, assuming that Owen means that Owen's body temperature is 98.6 degrees? <sighs> No, I can't get past my concern. Ah, that's, that's not true, John. You can get past your concern. You just don't want to because you don't want to admit that you don't know the answer because I'm smarter than you. No, we're just different kinds of smart. <laughs> All right. My mom's been telling me that my whole life. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so, so John, let's start out by saying, is there any situation you could imagine being in, uh, in, in something that was, you know, maybe say like 90 degrees but it doesn't feel hot to you. Well, yes, of course. What's that? 90 degree water. Correct. So what's the difference between water and air? Um, Well, there are a number of differences, you pedantic... <laughs> what what in this case what do you think might be the difference that causes that uh, that difference to be the Oh case? my god, I'm being reminded of how much I f- hated middle school science because <laughs> it was full of rhetorical <laughs> questions asked by a know-it-all teacher <laughs> who was like, "And what do you think?" And I'm just like, "You know the answer, just f- tell me." <laughs> Sorry, we're going to have to bleep a bunch of that because I got really genuinely angry at Hank. <laughs> Well, I like walking through the process of figuring it out. What is different between water and air? A number of things. Um, But I bet that the inside of my body has a ton of water in it, whereas the inside of my body has relatively little air. Yeah, that that's that's kind of the the thing. Um, It's that there is there there's far more water in water than there is air and air. Mm. So there are you know there there's just there's a massively large amount of molecules in water compared to the number of molecules in air, in air. So when you when you're in the air, um, your body is uh, is always no matter where you are, your body is always trying to cool itself off because the existence of a human being uh, in the world requires uh, the the consumption of energy and the consumption of energy always produces some heat. And that heat uh, w- continues to raise your body. Uh, and if you didn't have any way to cool down, you would overheat and die. And that is why, and, and the body has been designed to operate optimally in 70 degree air because uh, it, it's, you know, because actually, because that's sort of the average temperature of the earth. Um, but uh, as not if we, we have anything to say about it. <laughs> We are going to get that number up. People are always like, oh, human beings, like we don't reach for the stars, but we are reaching for the stars by destroying the atmosphere and raising the temperature of the planet. We are literally getting closer to the stars. <laughs> I mean, uh, it didn't make any sense to me, but I'll, I'll let it be. Um, but I mean, am I, am I wrong that if we, if we just thin out the atmosphere just a little bit that we'll be closer to the stars? Well, we're not thinning out the atmosphere at all. One, we're making it thicker. That's the problem. Two, no, mm. it wouldn't make us closer to the stars. <laughs> we're getting further from the stars. Uh, we are. <laughs> uh, I'm not an astronomer. I'm just reaching for a metaphor here. Ah. Uh. So uh, your body. So the answer is that there isn't that, that we we're always trying to cool ourselves off because we produce heat and there isn't that much. Yeah. Uh, there isn't that much 
air in air. Yeah. So you're always trying you're always trying to cool off, and so you need uh, molecules to touch you that are colder than you are, so that you can dump your heat into those molecules. That's why when it's windy, there are actually more molecules hitting you, and also this sort of layer of molecules that have already sucked your heat out uh, get blown away and are replaced by new molecules that are more of the original temperature, which is why fans work. Um, But if you're in water, uh, there's just so many more molecules that uh, it's much easier for your heat to disperse to them. So if you get in water that's 98.6 degrees, it basically feels like nothing is touching you at all, which is fascinating. Thanks for the question, Owen. Sorry that John hated it so much. I liked the question, Owen. I'm not. I, I'm. I didn't like Hank's answer. I wanted to work to be through clear. it. My issue is. I like it when it's a my story. My issue is not with Owen. My issue is with that, like, uh, the the like rhetorical know-it-all approach to answering questions. Like when when we are discussing poetry, do I ever say like, Hank, what is the rhythm of your heart, and start from there? No, I just like. Uh, well, anyway. I, I, from from my perspective, I think this is important. So I, I apologize for continuing to talk about it. But from my perspective, like I like to think about how people figured this out in the first place, or how I might figure it out without having someone tell it to me. And so when when I was asked that question from Owen, I didn't know the answer to that question, but I did know that getting in ninety degree water feels cool. So starting from that, I wanted to figure out like what is it about ninety degree water that makes it cool that might make me give me insight into why ninety degree air seems hot. Uh huh. <laughs> I still feel I still feel like a middle school student, which is the way I, I I like feeling least in the whole world. That I can understand that completely. Let's move on to a new question. Uh, this question is from Daniel, who asks, Dear John and Hank, is there a way to enjoy slow books? In other words, uh, books that have a droning and otherwise uninteresting tone. I'd love to read Lord of the Rings, but I've heard that it's very slow and easy to lose focus while reading it. That that question took an unexpected turn for me, Hank, because um, <laughs> when I think of slow books, I think of uh, this wonderful book uh, that I read in college called um, Islamization and Native Religion in the Golden Horde, which is about um, how the Uzbek people came to identify as Muslims. Um, and it's about 800 pages long, and it's it's definitely got some slow parts. It's got some really enjoyable <laughs> footnotes, but it's, um, it's a dry read, and um, it t- <laughs> took tremendous focus for me to read it, and yet it's still one of the most important books I've ever read. Like, I think about it all the time. Um, Lord of the Rings, on the other hand, I've, I found to be a pretty rip-roaring kind of read. <laughs> but I think that, uh, I, I think maybe this speaks to something that's changed in the culture in the last 15 years and changed about the um, uh, the kind of attentiveness that, that humans specialize in, um, having kind of been altered by uh, the internet. Uh, yeah, I, I, or, or just by the uh, constant availability of things to enjoy more than more than the internet itself right right by the by scrolling the idea of of scrolling being able to sort of permanently scroll uh through uh entertainment yeah i mean i think that it is important to be able to take uh some steps back from uh from the consumption of media and to be inside of your own brain for a while. Um, and maybe if that is something that uh, you are interested in doing, it might make slower experiences more enjoyable. I love to read a lot, but it took me a long time to get where to, to there. Um, and I, you know, I think that uh, I think there's an amount of like just letting it be and saying like okay well this is what i'm going to do for the next hour and if you read and your mind wanders then that's okay let your mind wander and when you notice that your mind has wandered bring it back and if it takes you you know an hour to read a chapter or if it takes i don't know how long a chapter of the lord of the rings is anymore but if it takes you what you would consider to be too long to be enjoying this thing but remember that you also spent time with your mind wandering with your mind doing things and and working out problems and and considering what happened to it today um and there's nothing wrong with that yeah i mean i i I completely agree with you i don't think reading is something that you are born knowing how to do, obviously. And it's not something that you like, it's something that gets better with practice um, and gets much worse without practice. I found that in my own life, like since Henry and Alice were born, it's I, I have 
I, or I don't, I, I spend less time reading than I used to. And as a result, my reading has gotten worse. Um, my reading comprehension is worse. My reading speed is worse. Um, I, I, I read fewer books per, per year, and I think I read them less well, less generously than I used to. Um, and But I don't think that's just because uh, I have kids now. I also think it's because uh, I spend too much time uh, passively ingesting media, and then the the active work of reading feels much harder for me than it used to. Um, so I, I, that's something I think a lot about, um, and I do. It, it does concern me. I love the I, I love the internet, and um, I appreciate the enjoyment that distraction culture provides me. But I do worry a little bit about the fact that um, I th- I feel like overall I kind of lead a less engaged life than I than I used to, and reading is is one strong place where I see that. I like our answer. I have a question from Maddie that I think is important, but is going to be no fun. Maddie asks, Dear Hank and John, my younger sister recently graduated from college with a degree in marketing and PR. She elected not to go to grad school right away and instead wanted to work for a year and decide whether she wanted to get a master's degree. However, instead of looking for a job, she got involved in a pyramid scheme. She talks passionately about it to everyone who will listen and managed to convince most of the people she knows to spend lots of money and buy into the program. Her degree, combined with her personality, makes her a great salesperson. She's spending a lot of money every month on the program and is spending more and more time trying to build her business instead of looking for a job. Do you have any advice on how I can talk to her without uh, upsetting her and making her understand and make her understand that her decision to stay in that business might not be the best one for her? Uh, I really hate pyramid schemes, so I wanted to answer this question. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say. I think that uh, it's it's extremely difficult when you are inside of a pyramid scheme a lot of times to understand that you are inside of a pyramid scheme. Um, there's also... Uh, something of a fine line between uh, a pyramid scheme and direct sales programs, right? Like, I, I guess maybe we should start off by defining what a pyramid scheme is. So uh, here it is in, in its basic form. Uh, I say uh, to my brother Hank, Hank, if you give me $10, I will teach you how to get people to give you $10. And and then Hank goes forth with that knowledge and and but but it, and then also if you could just send me one of the dollars that you make every time you get someone uh, you teach someone how to make ten dollars and then Hank teaches two people how to make ten dollars. Well, I have now made twelve dollars um, uh, just just by teaching Hank how to make ten dollars. And then but but if if more people convince more people how to make ten dollars, uh, I will make much more than twelve dollars um, because I am at the top of the pyramid. The people at the bottom of the pyramid, which will be a progressively larger number of people, um, will eventually find that they are unable to find people uh, to teach how to make ten dollars. But a lot of times pyramid schemes um, or or pyramid shaped businesses uh, aren't just about like, you know, that basic fraud. They may be about selling, uh, you know, selling something, selling some physical good, you know, health bars. And yeah. that's where it get that's where it gets yeah. complicated. It, you often find that the physical good that's being involved in the pyramid scheme is is basically just sort of there as a uh, as a way to make it seem more legitimate, and so it will be like ridiculously overpriced in some way. Uh, and really, it's about you know people trying to get other people to give them money because there's this dream of getting rich, uh, and that is that is why they are often called get rich quick schemes. They're also called multi level marketing schemes because the idea is that you're 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 marketing at all these multiple levels and sort of sending money up. And if the, the sooner you can get in on the game, the better it is for you. Um, it's it's very difficult to like th- these things are are designed in really clever ways and uh, and and it's kind of it can often be something that like it, it's almost like something that you should imagine as like it's something that happened to a person like getting hit by a car that it's very difficult to control and then it makes it, it, and, and then it makes them sort of like you know more difficult to deal with for a while because uh they are that was a bad example. <laughs> yeah, it's more like buying into a cult than it is like getting hit by a car. I can't think of a single way in which it's well, like getting it, hit by a car. I, I, yeah, what I'm trying to say, it's 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 a little like something that just that happens to a person, and and it's very difficult to have it unhappen to them, um, and especially because once they you know get involved and they start recruiting friends and family, they have to admit to themselves that they have gotten their friends and family involved in this thing that is in fact you know, 
very bad for them. And, uh, and, and like admitting that, especially when you've got all of this sort of like psychological, cool, like hookiness that the, that these schemes use to convince people that they are in fact a legitimate business enterprise, uh, admitting that becomes uh, very difficult and and it tends to come in the form of like eventual failure when you no longer are making money from the scheme and then embarrassment and shame uh, which comes along with having previously alienated yourselves from all of your loved ones who you tried to get involved with the scheme and either uh, either got annoyed with you or uh, or you know bought in but then failed sooner than they did because it tends to fail upward so it fails from the bottom up and uh and 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 that is just a terrible thing to have happen but because of the psychological hooks of the the multi-level marketing scheme it's like arguing with people about it tends to make them get even more obsessed and interested in it and sort of believe in it especially once they've bought in enough that they're spending a lot of their own money and they don't want to admit they've made a mistake and also they've gotten their friends and family involved and they don't want to admit to themselves that they've done a bad thing to their friends and family as a sister a lot like basically what you can do is is to be supportive uh in in a difficult time like that's kind of what this is it's a difficult time and and just because they haven't realized it's a difficult time doesn't mean that it isn't and uh, and and then it will in the future be a much more difficult time as they come to realize the the difficulty and and sort of like the you know like that they've spent a lot of their time and energy on on something that was a bad use of their time and energy and money yeah i mean i think in general you know, there's lots of situations in life where you have to love people um, who are making mistakes. Um, uh, I mean, you also have to accept, of course, that you might be wrong, um, that this might be a completely legitimate business enterprise. It probably isn't, um, but it, it is in her mind. Um, and so you just have to uh, lovingly uh, not support someone, which is very difficult to do. Um, but uh, I think it's... it. it when it's going to be really important is when it all falls apart uh, for her to know that that you still uh, love her and um, that and anything that can kind of decrease the shame spiral uh, decreases the power of you know not just pyramid schemes but lots of lots of different things that prey on human psychology and and human emotion. So I think um, you know loving someone and not judging them is incredibly powerful. I agree, John. Okay, Hank, we have another question. This one is from uh, Brenna, who writes, Dear John and Hank, so my roommate and I just moved into an on-campus apartment and we are cooking dinner for ourselves for the first time. My question is, at what point in adulthood do you get over the fear of giving your dinner guests salmonella? Not there yet. Yep, I'm not there. I do not know. Um, (laughs) You definitely passed 38. That's all we can say for sure, Brenna. I can't see into the future. But I worry... I mean, I spend a lot of time cleaning cooking surfaces and trying to make sure that no raw food um, has been touched in any way without yeah. extensive hand washing. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think that the number one way to get over this fear is to work in a a commercial kitchen, either at uh, at a restaurant. Probably yeah. is the most likely circumstance that you would be doing that, and then you would know a great deal, and yeah. you would have a lot of experience with not giving people salmonella. And uh, but without that, well, but also having worked at having worked at a restaurant, Hank, I can tell you that uh, you don't always learn how to <laughs> not give people salmonella. <laughs> <laughs> you got to make the mistake to learn the lesson. Unfortunately, I don't mean to crush all your <laughs> dreams, but um, you, you, you should worry when you go out to eat. You should make sure that that hamburger is well and truly <laughs> cooked. Um, I had uh, I had norovirus uh, a, a few years ago, this 24-hour uh, vomiting uh, and diarrheal illness that... Um, we were talking earlier about how my wedding day, uh, I, I don't remember it as a particularly important day in my marriage. I do remember my, my day with norovirus <laughs> as a particularly interesting and important day in my marriage uh, because... Me too, actually. Yeah, no, there is... You don't know true love um, <laughs> <laughs> until you've suffered through norovirus with, you, with your partner. Um, and... You know, looking back on that day, I often think like, am I overreacting about food safety? And then I think, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> I It was an amazing day for me, my norovirus day, because I was just laying in bed 
And then I and then I I burped. And then I was like, Catherine, I don't feel well. And then I sat up in bed. And then I exploded. <laughs> uh, and and she handled it just so well. Yeah. Like I like I I got out of the bathroom a half an hour later, and like the room was for the most part cleaned up. <laughs> and I was just like, wow, you just. You just freaking did that. You were like, okay, time to time to take care of stuff. It's done. Yeah. Wow. I was super impressed. Uh, and yeah, hadn't hadn't gotten that uh, chance to to like really like see what she was made of until right. then. I uh, I remember that I ate uh, I ate a bowl of chili. Uh, wonderful. Oh home god, cooked, home cooked chili. <laughs> I'd had a Whole Foods sushi for lunch, and then I had a, a wonderful <laughs> bowl of chili. And I was just going downstairs to get my standard second bowl of chili, <laughs> um, oh <my laughs> which I, I've never in my life eaten just one bowl of chili. What's the point? And so I was going downstairs to eat my standard second bowl of chili, and I thought to myself, you know, there's something a little weird uh, in my stomach right now, <laughs> and maybe. Just maybe I should hold off on this second bowl of chili. And then I thought, nah, I'm fine. I'm probably fine. <laughs> and I ate, I ate about five bites of my second bowl of chili. And then I was like, I am going to throw up. And not like eventually, <laughs> but like in the next 10 seconds. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even get that much warning. It was it was literally the day after Thanksgiving. So I had done the thing where you eat all of the Thanksgiving leftovers. Oh god. So I was just full to the top with with cranberry juice and oh, yeah. and, and stuffing oh, and yeah. potatoes oh, yeah. and yams no, and I remember marshmallows the, and I remember the pie. seaweed from the whole food sushi. Like at the end, you know, at the at the bottom. <laughs> after everything, after all the chili. Oh. Oh man, John, this episode needs a trigger warning. <laughs> oh, it Ooh. came back up in order. It was brutal. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, oh, thank man. God we finally found something funny in this stupid humor podcast. <laughs> oh, norovirus. Anyway, norovirus is not caused by contaminated food usually. So yeah. it's caused by eating someone else's poop. <laughs> or puke. Or... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Usually poop, though. Um, so I, if it does, if it if it makes you feel bad to think that like, oh god, I definitely ate someone's poop. There's a chance that you ate someone's vomit. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that really gets to me about being a person <laughs> who you know like has this mind and and ostensibly this soul, but is stuck inside of a physical body, is that I, I mean, like, how many people's poop have I eaten? Hundreds, thousands. <laughs> Seriously, that's not a that's not a rhetorical question. I'm a, you, you told me how many bacteria there are in my body a few episodes ago. I'm asking you now, how many people's poop have I eaten? I mean, <laughs> a lot, right? Like more than five. I, probably, probably, probably over a hundred. A bunch of strangers. Yeah, I would say I will definitely over a hundred. Um, I mean, I mean prob most, I'm sure that the vast majority of times you eat someone's poop, there's no negative consequence at all. And you probably eat your own poop every single day. Just, just cross-contamination is too common. You know, the other, the other thing I was thinking recently, Hank, is I was kayaking in the White River. Um, the White River is a beautiful river in Indianapolis, uh, but when it rains more than a quarter of an inch in the city, they just directly dump all of the poop uh, in the sewers into the river. <laughs> Um, and that's not an exaggeration. Yep. Uh, that is a fact. It happens maybe like 50 or 60 times a year. And um, I was kayaking and I was going up something of a rapid and, and a large amount of water entered my mouth. Like probably I would say between <laughs> three and six drops of water uh, entered my mouth oh, simultaneously. I and I'd, obviously I tried to spit it out as much as possible. But I mean, there could be hundreds of people's poop just in those three drops of water. Oh, almost certainly there was. And what I'm saying is that like, if you if you like me have a fear of contamination it's not irrational like it's not one of the things that really bothers me about uh people well it's a little bit irrational in that it's unavoidable and that it is usually uh it is usually fine well no but the fact is i am contaminated so it is incorrect for like for instance a, a psychotherapist to tell me that my fear of contamination is is irrational when when in fact i am constantly contaminated with hundreds of other people's stuff oh well you, it's not the fear uh, i'm i'm saying that you you're you're the reality that you are contaminated is absolutely true oh god the fear of it is what is irrational 
Let's move on to uh, no, no, our no. last question we have for, to, uh, for today. It, we, it com- we, we, have to, we have to let everyone know that this episode of Hank, Dear Hank and John is sponsored by Other People's Poop. <laughs> um, <laughs> other People's Poop, it's everywhere, and you eat it. Oh, God. <laughs> this, this episode of Dear Hank and John is also sponsored by your wedding. Your wedding. Yeah. <laughs> This episode of Dear Hank and John is brought to you by the totally not a pyramid scheme Hank and John Green Magical Lip Balm Company. <laughs> the Hank and John Magical Lip Balm Company. $14 lip balm, but boy is it good. <laughs> yes. send, it, send it our way and we'll teach you how to sell other people magical lip balm. And of course, this episode of Dear Hank and John is brought to you by middle school science teachers. Middle school science teachers knowing it all since the beginning of time. <laughs> Okay, Hank, we have time for one last question before we get to the news from Mars and AFC Wimbledon. It's a vitally important question. It comes from Sarah, who writes, Dear John and Hank, is honesty really always the best policy, or are there some situations in which discretion is best for everyone? Sarah, this is such an important question because I can't tell you how much I wish I could go back in time to the time before Hank told me that most of the cells in my body are not mine. <laughs> It's impossible for me to express the blissful ignorance that I enjoyed for the first 38 years of my life, assuming that most of me was in fact me and not microorganisms. (laughs) So yes, honesty is not always the best policy. Discretion is often the best um, yeah, I, I I agree. I do enjoy being honest when uh, when when others think that it is not a good idea. Uh, it's, I I also enjoy that when other people do it. Um, and I I think that it can cut to the the chase a lot, especially in business uh, and when there's a lot of posturing going on, or in other circumstances where there might be a lot of posturing going on. But I think in, in normal everyday. Well, Sarah's question, right. to be fair, is about affection, you know, right. like a romantic interest. Um, it was she. She did not originally intend it to be a question about uh, the human biome. <laughs> <sighs> uh, but ah, at this point, yes. I can't read any other question. I can't read any question in, in in a different context. But yeah. But yeah, I think I think in the world of affections, it's often it's often quite useful uh, to get to honesty quickly. But um, but but of course, there is a real. Um, an undeniable risk of loss in that as well. Yeah, I mean, especially if you, uh, especially if you know that they're uh, that person is already in a relationship, or if that they are definitely not interested in you, or any of the other, you know, if they are interested in people of a different gender than you are, um, then you know that is a. Uh, it's often like you know. Uh, my suggestion is not like, oh, don't be honest, but yeah, don't be honest, but also uh, figure out a way to not be so affectionate toward them. I often like to uh, to examine people. What? I don't agree with this advice. Sometimes you should be honest. It depends on the situation. I agree. Oh yes, I I agree. Take away all of the things I said, Nick. You're bas- Start- you basically just told Sarah like, don't no, don't tell them, don't tell the person you like that you like them. Well, maybe tell them. <laughs> Depends on the situation, Sarah. <laughs> Honestly, don't don't take any of our advice seriously. Do you know how many people's poop I've eaten, Sarah? Hundreds. <laughs> I was misunderstanding the question. I apologize. I didn't. I didn't. Yes. Oh, I I am surrounded by a terrible darkness, Hank. What's the news from Mars? Uh, there are pebbles on Mars, John. <laughs> Oh my god, are you serious? Yeah, uh, but... Pebbles? In addition to there being pebbles, they are they are pebbles of a certain uh, of, of size and coarseness that indicate that not only did they uh, exist inside of a, a river, but they existed inside of a river that flowed uh, for miles and miles and miles, and, uh, and those rocks uh, flowed down with that river for miles over a long period of time. Not over, not over a short period, not in a mass flood event, but in, uh, in a circumstance that... Uh, looked a lot like one we might have here on Earth. That is incredibly exciting. I don't even know what to say. I'm breathless uh, to know that there are pebbles on Mars that look a little bit like the pebbles that we have right here on Earth, including in South London, where AFC Wimbledon play almost every Saturday. Um, Well, Hank, the news from AFC Wimbledon um, is, uh, is... is about as interesting as the news from Mars this week. 
Um, <laughs> AMC Wimbledon uh, last week played Oxford United. Uh, you know, Oxford, that's where they have that uh, fancy college in England. Um, I've never thought much of, uh, of the football club that hails from Oxford, but they did beat, uh, they did beat AFC Wimbledon one to nothing. Uh, it's just, a, it was a distressing, distressing game. And indeed, like you can't help but be a bit worried by our lack of goal production. Um, but, uh, we're taking on more camb this weekend, which will be in the past, uh, as, as we listen to the podcast. So let us hope that we have a glorious victory to celebrate, uh, because, uh, you know, I would really, I, I, I want the narrative of AFC Wimbledon to be a club on the rise, but then I would also accept the narrative of AFC Wimbledon to be a club in comfortable stasis. But, uh, the lack of offensive (laughs) production is a bit worrisome, particularly given how much, uh, talent we have up front. Um, with the, the likes of Autobio and Fenwa. So, uh, yeah, that's the news from AFC yeah. Wimbledon. What, what, let's, uh, let, why, why do you think, uh, why, why do you think that is, John? Why do you think that, uh, that uh, the, the, the Wimbleys are having a hard time getting, getting the ball in the net? I appreciate you, your feigned interest, first off. I'd just like to say that. Um, but <laughs> so I haven't been able to watch a game this year on account of how they, believe it or not, they don't put fourth tier English football on TV in the United States. <laughs> um, but my understanding uh, from fans and uh, from reading everything on the website and from listening to the games on the radio is that uh, we just don't have a lot of control of the ball in midfield. So re- really, uh, the game of soccer uh, is a game of, think of it as a game of three thirds, right? You've got your defensive third, you've got the, the middle third of the, of the pitch, and then you've got your, your attacking third. The ability to get it from the defensive third when you recover possession through the middle third into the attacking third, that's the, cent- that, that, that's the entire game. Like the whole, the whole game is actually played in, in midfield. Um, so we have good finishers of the ball, but we don't have, uh, we just haven't had a ton of luck uh, getting sustained possession in that attacking third because it requires traveling through the midfield. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Yeah. So anyway, I, I'm sure that there are brighter days to come. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, at least I hope so, because this has been one depressing comedy podcast. <laughs> well, it, and it's been a depressing pod- comedy podcast in which we learned what, John? Well, Hank, we learned that norovirus uh, can teach you more about your marriage than your wedding can. Yeah, we learned we learned that there's something about the number of molecules that hit your body that controls how well you can cool off, and that cooling off is important, and that John does not want to be back in middle school in any way <laughs> at all, ever, at all. And of course, uh, we learned that uh, the rivers that no longer flow on Mars once made pebbles. Which is sort of beautiful now that I think about it. This is uh, this has been Dear Hank and John. If you would like to send us questions, you can do so at dearhankandjohn at gmail.com. Isn't it just hankandjohn at gmail.com? Oh, you're right. You're right. Sure. No, it's fine. You can send it to dearhankandjohn at gmail.com too. Just we won't read them because that's not our email address. <laughs> Uh, this podcast is edited by Nicholas Jenkins. It, uh, the theme music that you're hearing now is uh, from the remarkable Gunnarova. And as they say in our hometown, don't, don't forget, forget to, to be, be awesome. awesome.